In this video, I'm going to go over the uh, final essay and the final essay proposal, the two remaining written assignments for this course. Um, you're going to be talking more about both of these things in tutorials, but probably a good idea to give you as much information as soon as possible so you can get going on these things. So I'll first talk about the final essay proposal, um, but then I'll give some sort of broad outlines of what we're looking for in the final essay so you have a better idea of what to propose. Okay, so let's just look at the instructions for the final essay proposal. This stuff is straight from the syllabus. So in the essay proposal, students will write a short, that is 200 to 500 word proposal for what their essay topic and approach will be. Your thoughts here do not need to be fully developed and it is expected that they will evolve as you write the final essay. So your proposal is not something that you're gonna be held to in any kind of strict sense. Um, it's extremely common, uh, almost expected that as you write, your topic is gonna to change in maybe subtle or maybe not so subtle ways. And that's just kind of part of the process of writing an essay. Like you don't usually know what you're going to write until basically until you, after you've written it. Um, so uh, it would be a good idea if you're doing a major topic switch. That is, if you're just completely throwing out what's in your proposal and doing something completely new, get in touch with your TA to make sure that you're still writing on something that's sort of within the purview of this course. But we're not going to penalize you if you change, and uh, you know you're not being you're not being held to this proposal. Mostly I, the idea here is to get you going on the final essay before the last minute. Okay, and then the second part of this assignment is the proposal should also contain an annotated bibliography of at least three entries. Uh, those citations should be related to the topic proposed and will hopefully constitute the beginning of your research for your final essay. Very short summaries of the thesis and argument of the citations constitute the annotation. So we'll look at that in just one minute. Okay, so uh, just you, you've got the proposal section. The proposal section is 200 to 500 words. And then there's this annotated bibliography. It says at least three entries here, but three is three is the number to go with. Go with three entries. Uh, more is unnecessary. Less is bad, but more doesn't help you. So um, I want to just show you the rubric for this really quickly so that you know what you're aiming for. And <clears throat> unlike a lot of written assignments in the humanities, this is one I think that you could genuinely get 100% on. So I, I do expect there'll be some, some students that get 100% on this proposal because there's just a kind of very specific list of things to tick off. So uh, the overall mark is going to be out of 10. Uh, you get three marks for the proposal section is between 200 and 500 words. Uh, that's, that's certainly an achievable goal. So we, did you propose something and did it take between 200 and 500 words? Um, the proposal identifies a topic related to the interaction between science and values. So is this topic like broadly in the ballpark of what this course has been on about? If you've got any doubts about that, you can get in touch with me or you could get in touch with your TAs. Um, I mean, if it's something that I've talked about in this course, then it's going to be within the purview of science and values. But I'll give you a couple more uh, uh, comments at the end of this when we're talking about the final essay itself for what would count as being in this ballpark. Okay. Uh, and then the proposal either provides a rough thesis or a direction for further research. So uh, again, you're not expected to know exactly what you're gonna be writing yet, but uh, a working thesis is often helpful to kind of guide your research and thinking. Uh, and or <clears throat> just if you haven't got that far yet, that's fine. Just tell us something that you're gonna look further into. Um, okay, so that's the, those are all of the marks for the proposal part of this. That's the, uh, let's see, that's six out of 10 for the proposal section. Uh, and then there's four marks for the annotated bibliography section. That is <clears throat> one mark for there being three scholarly citations in the annotated bibliography. They do need to be scholarly, so don't cite random websites or blogs or somebody's Twitter feed or something like that. Um, and then uh, three marks for the main ideas of the citations are described in a few sentences. Okay, so uh, under on Quirkus under week 10, I will post um, both a more detailed version of this rubric that depend, that sort of fleshes these out a little bit, and also an example that I've worked up of an essay proposal. So you'll have something to look at, so you'll have a, a rough idea of what we're looking for. Um, so I did this... Uh, essay proposal by imagining that I was uh, Tim Lewins uh, trying to get ready to write the paper, the readings for this week. So 
this essay proposal, I'm proposing to write the readings that you read this week. Um, so that made it pretty easy for me to get quite specific about what I was going to write. Um, probably you won't be in a position to get quite this specific in your essay proposal. Um, but that's fine. Like, please don't panic. Don't, don't think that you have to be quite at this, at this level. Uh, I do think that this essay proposal example would get 10 out of 10. So this is, this is an example of something that could get a, a perfect mark for this, for this assignment. So, um, you can see I use I here. Please go ahead and use I. Basically just uh, laying out what the rough plan is. I plan to write about the idea of human nature, and then I get into more detail about that. You know, what's the stakes of the debate? <clears throat> There's a debate about human nature and how to characterize it. And then I start talking about different people who've talked about it, and then uh, go on to explain what I think I'm going to argue about it. So again, None of the details that you provide in this will be something that will hold you to. So your TA is not going to go back to your proposal and make sure you said exactly what you were going to say, uh, said you would in the proposal. Um, this is really just to get you, get the ball rolling on this stuff for you. Okay, so, uh, and then there's uh, the annotated bibliography section. So uh, it's essentially just a short summary of three sources which you think might hopefully be relevant to your project. Uh, I've just pulled three sources out of Lewin's bibliography and done, as you can see, very short summaries, basically just saying what their main thesis is, uh, their main, the main idea that they're getting at in that paper, and uh, something, a little bit something about their argument. Really looking for like three to six sentences here, and if these are three to six well-formed sentences that uh, roughly describe the content of the paper, that's it. That's all we're, that's all we're looking for. So you really don't need to uh, you really don't need to get into any great depth here. Uh, we're not looking for your own brilliant insights in this. You're really just summarizing what the paper is about. And if that paper has an abstract, really you're just going to be rephrasing bits of the abstract. Uh, do do write this in your own words, so uh, don't, don't use block quotations here. But um, really you're just sort of summarizing what those sources are about. Okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, that's basically it for the final essay proposal. Um, now, probably in, you're wondering what it is you should be proposing because that's that's the sort of tricky bit of this. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what we're looking for in the final essays themselves, not just the proposal, but the actual submitted final essay. And hopefully that'll give you some kind of picture about the what would make a what would make a good sort of project here. Okay, so for your final essay. What you're going to do is identify some conversation in the scholarly, scholarly literature on science and values and weigh in on it. You're going to give your opinion about some conversation that's ongoing. So uh, if you want a really nice example of what this looks like in the ideal case, I mean, again, the readings for this week are a beautiful example. Um, consider consider Lewin's paper, Human Nature, the Very Idea. Um, now, your essays are going to be much shorter than this, so your essays are uh, under 3,000 words. Um, uh, sorry, that's not the exact figure. I think they're 1,500 to 2,500 words, I believe. Um, Lewin's paper is much longer than that, so you're not going to be able to get into as much depth as, he, depth as he does. And also, he's an extremely good professional philosopher, so your, your writing is probably not going to be quite as good as Lewin's. Uh, I wish mine was. But um, the basic structure and the basic uh, activity these engage in, I think, is the same thing that you're going to be doing in your, in your final essay. So the, the basic project is the same. So let me talk a little bit about what the project of a paper like this is. Like, what's it doing? What is he, what is he trying to accomplish here? So uh, this might be your first time reading contemporary work in philosophy. Uh, it might be that you've only read... Uh, sort of older philosophical works. It might be that you've never read philosophy before at all. So uh, your TAs will have read dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of papers, basically in the style uh, that Lewin's is writing here. Um, and Lewin's paper is structured the way it is, kind of because of the way contemporary philosophy research goes. Um, so anyone can do philosophy. I mean, I think... Uh, at the beginning of this course, I defined philosophy as something like seeing how things in general hang together 
uh, that kind of thing. So anybody can participate in the project of trying to understand the big picture of things. But academic philosophers, people who work in philosophy departments, have a pretty specific version of that activity. And basically what you're doing in this essay is participating in that activity a little bit. Um, so uh, the thing that academic philosophers these days do, by and large, is almost always to take up a conversation that other people are already already have rolling and contribute to it. So uh, philosophers of science specifically do this, uh, not just taking up the conversations of other philosophers, but also of scientists. So uh, philosophy of science is basically characterized by like people taking up ongoing big picture questions, ongoing conversations that are happening about uh, large scale issues, and then philosophers of science just listen to scientists as well as other philosophers. The reason why people start from an ongoing conversation is that when people try to do philosophy without kind of grounding in what's already been said, what the result is horrifyingly inefficient. So what almost always happens when people try to do philosophy without having read philosophy is they rehash old ideas and those old ideas might have been presented hundreds of years ago sometimes and there's been hundreds of years of responses and nuances and critiques of those ideas and uh you know you just kind of have to redo the whole project if you're not reading some philosophy to do philosophy you make the same old mistakes uh you fall into the same old traps that people have identified and worked with for a really long time so by grounding your idea in existing literature you don't eliminate the threat of that like People still do this all the time. They, they come up with an idea that somebody had 300 years ago and they don't realize that somebody's had it. But you do mitigate the danger of it. So an ongoing conversation hopefully has some of the sort of collective understanding that's been built up over time baked into it uh, in the way that it's framed and the kind of sources and references that it draws on. And with any luck, uh, you're ahead of the game in the sense that you're... Um, making incremental progress in the conversation rather than starting it from scratch every, every generation. So that's why uh, philosophy is typically framed these days in terms of what other people have said. And that's, that's the thing. Um, and if you look at the sort of the way that the uh, philosophy paper is structured, it always starts from, you know, this person said X, this person said Y, I'm going to talk about you know, which of them is right and why kind of thing. Um, the point of a contemporary philosophy paper is almost never to solve the issue once and for all. Um, what we can do is advance a conversation by critiquing and articulating uh, ideas that other people have had, uh, advancing our own ideas on the basis of those critiques and maybe getting a little bit further than they got. We chip away at it. Basically, we chip away at these ideas. These are big picture ideas that we're working with and we try to like take little bites out of them. So this isn't philosophy in the sense of like world shaking genius visionary, uh, you know, here's the answer to life, the universe and everything. That's not really what contemporary philosophers do. Um, rather it's a, uh, it's a strategy. So working within an ongoing conversation and relating what you're saying to what other people have said, is a strategy for trying to take these humongous problems on bit by bit. Um, so that's what we're hoping you're going to do in your essays. You're not supposed to be reinventing the kind of big questions of philosophy, and you're not having a conversation in a void. You're not just sort of saying what you think. You're saying what you think about what other people think. Um, so you don't have to come up with a complete theory of the perfect scientific method or solve the question of science and values permanently or anything like that. You just identify a conversation that other people have been having and try to advance it in some way, to improve it in some way or other. Okay, so uh, when we're thinking about the structure of a, a piece of contemporary philosopher, philosophy, it's almost always uh, structured with what you would call busy readers in mind. Um, so people who are trying to make incremental progress on ongoing conversations and these conversations are huge and vast and sprawling and the boundaries of the conversations are unclear uh, which means that you spend a lot of time reading papers that are 
maybe not exactly relevant to what you're trying to read or write about. So the structure of a contemporary philosophy paper is designed with that in mind. So it's, it's written for somebody who's got not enough time and not enough energy to read everything that's been written about a topic. Uh, and what they want is to, what the, what the journal articles are sort of structured to do is to give you a kind of entryway into a conversation situated in where, okay, where are we in this conversation and to present to you as efficiently as possible, uh, some piece of, of, of a contribution to that conversation. So, um, you know, good writing in general, uh, does its best to respect the reader and to prevent, present them with the most efficient reading experience that they can get. Um, and you're going to appreciate this as a reader of this stuff, um, because you are trying to do some research in philosophy and you don't have enough time to read everything that's been written about it. So, uh, the way that, uh, papers are structured is to invite what you might call aggressive skimming, or at least a quick, uh, check to see whether the paper that you've got in front of you is relevant to your project. So that comes out most clearly in the abstract. So I would like you to write, uh, we'll talk more about the exact formatting of the final essay later, but I do want you to write an abstract for your final papers and you'll be grateful when research paper, papers that you're reading have an abstract. Um, because this is where the sort of the basic point that you're presenting is presented as sort of short and compactly as possible. Um, and when you're reading journal articles in philosophy, um, having this abstract is just gold because you can quickly assess whether this is going to be relevant to your project or not relevant to your project. Hopefully that's the point of an abstract to like give you the, give you the basic idea right up front as fast and quickly as possible so that you can assess whether it's worth your while to read the rest of the paper. Now your TAs are going to read your whole papers. You don't have to motivate them to read the papers. They are, they are, uh, employed to do that. Um, but I do want you to practice making your essays aggressively skimmable. So writing in a fashion that would be useful to somebody who's under the same kind of time and energy pressures that we are all under pretty much all the time. So writing for the reader to have an efficient reading experience is definitely one of the skills that we're going to hope that you'll develop through this, through this process. Um, so, uh, you'll write an abstract that abstract will give the kind of main ideas of your paper in the shortest possible space that you can. Um, and that'll be helpful for your TA to like understand the structure of your paper. Okay. And then you'll do an introduction after the abstract. There's typically an introduction. This is the, this is the standard structure for a philosophy paper. The introduction is the place where you kind of lay out the broad topic, what it is and why it matters. Um, so you, set the stakes of the conversation. So, uh, in Lewin's case, this is about, uh, saying things like, you know, why do we care about whether there is such a thing as human nature? What does it matter? And for him, that's crucially important because he separates notions of human nature into ones that matter for his question and ones that don't matter for his question. And, uh, that kind of like setting the stakes, helps to evaluate the argument that you give for your position. So, you know, is your argument good enough? Well, that depends on why the question you're addressing matters. Uh, right. So, uh, the introduction is where you kind of describe the conversation that you want to weigh in on. Hopefully there's a few different voices in that conversation that you're going to, uh, in some sense, uh, uh move between. Uh, and then you broadly say what your, your take on it is going to be. Okay. And then of course there's the body, there's the rest of the paper, uh, where you actually present your argument. And we do want you to have an argument. We do want you to have a thesis, a position that you're defending about some, about the conversation that you're going to try to engage in. So, um, a thesis is a hard thing to develop. I think one of the uh, one of the things that comes out most regularly in undergraduate writing is the failure to have a thesis and a thesis is, you know, it's the main idea that you're getting at. That sounds like it shouldn't be that hard, but a remarkable number of people fail to do this the first few times they try it. It's hard because it's not just about having one sentence where you say, this is what my point is. You have to have that one sentence that you say, here's my point. And then the whole rest of the paper needs to 
be structured around establishing that point. So it's not just about having one sentence in there, a thesis statement. You do need a thesis statement, but you need to structure everything else in the paper around first explaining what the what you're saying, what conversation you're saying it in and why, and then establishing that your thesis is true. So it's about the relationship between one or two sentences, your thesis statement, and the whole rest of the paper. So we'll talk more about this in uh, tutorials. What is, a, what is a thesis? How do you defend one? That kind of thing. Uh, for now, just know that what, what we're looking for here is for you to have a position on the conversation. So you identify a conversation that's ongoing in the literature because that's what we do in philosophy now. We do this sort of piecemeal chipping away at conversations thing. And then you try to advance that conversation somehow. And the way in which you're advancing it is your thesis, your, your take on it that you're going to defend with arguments and evidence. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the basic structure of the paper. You know, abstract, most compact version, intro, laying out the conversation that you're going to participate in, and then the body where you participate in the conversation. Okay, uh, okay. so, uh, but you're probably still wondering, okay, yeah, but what do I write about? Uh, which is a good question. So let's talk a little bit about the kind of topics that would be appropriate for the final essay. Um, the only, we're going to be pretty broad minded about this. I mean, lots of different topics will be acceptable. Really the only constraint, the main constraint is that it's got to be something about the interaction between science and values. It's got to be something appropriate for this course. And, uh, that's, that's just the, how science and values are, are interacting in some way. Um, there are lots of different approaches within that. So, uh, we've talked in this course about a number of ways in which maybe, our values influence science. So that's a that's a take that you could that you could pursue. We've also talked a little bit about maybe ways in which science can influence our values. Uh, that's that's been the topic of the human nature stuff for this week. So either of those really broad ways of approaching this are are, are good. Anything that I've talked about in class is a is going to be a valid topic. So if it was the topic for one of the lectures that we've gone through, that's obviously going to be within the purview of this course. So it's it's a valid thing to uh, work on. Um, more specifically, well, slightly more specifically, these are still very broad areas. So you'll have to find something. If you choose one of these areas, you'll have to find something much more specific within it. But here are some broad topics. Um, so we talked about bias, ideology, and fraud uh, in science and the methods for dealing with it. You might talk about the replication crisis. You might talk about um, sort of the ways in which scientific research programs become biased. You might look at one specific scientific research program. So if you're in a science, so if you're if you're majoring in some science or other and you've done some a, a fair amount of coursework in it already, uh, what I strongly recommend is that you leverage that knowledge. I mean, obviously you don't have to, but uh, if you got a good bit of knowledge about some scientific discipline, it's it's a really good plan to uh, like leverage that. So make make your topic about the thing that you're majoring in, but with a philosophical angle. Um, so that's a that's a sort of easy go to like okay, I'm how do I pick a topic? Well, I'm majoring in biology. Okay, great. So write about something something about. Uh, bias, ideology, or fraud in biology, and that's that's a that's a, a great topic. Okay, um, you could write about the ethics of a scientific or technological project. So next, after the reading week, we'll talk about genetic engineering. We'll talk about the ethics of AI. We'll talk about the ethics of uh, geoengineering. Those are all topics where we're just really asking ourselves, like, w what is the moral or ethical way to apply some theory or technology? Um, so there's a broad range of topics where you can uh, look at that type of interaction between science and values. Um, very, very broadly, again, the interaction of science and society. So um, like topics that come to mind are things like scientific racism, um, the, the kind of the ways in which science and society interact in uh, maybe like, yeah, uh, so... The, there's a whole field of science and technology studies that does a kind of basically this this approach, which is looking at the ways that social and scientific issues interact in, in dense ways. So uh, anything under that broad umbrella. Uh, if you want to really get to the heart of this course, 
you might write about, or at least the heart of what we, ta we talked about for the first month of this course, you might want to write, write about scientific objectivity and the value-free ideal. So this is something that we started with and have sort of, I think, I think I've mostly said everything I want to say about it. Um, but there's this question of like, how objective is science? And especially how objective is it in the sense of being free of values? And do values play a serious role in guiding scientific research? There's a really rich literature on this. So if you want to get into this conversation, there's lots and lots of places to get into it. Um, so that would be a that would be an extremely on topic uh, for this course. Um, there's loads more. I mean, I'm just trying to give you a sample. I would I would love for you to sort of be creative with this. Um, but uh, that's a kind of broad, broad brush uh, sample of the kind of topics that that we'll be that we'll be looking at for. Okay. All right. So uh, that's a kind of broad overview of what we're looking for in the final essay. Uh, hopefully, that gives you enough guidance for coming up with a topic for your essay proposal. Uh, Essay proposals are going to be due. Uh, we've pushed back the due date. If you haven't heard that news, pushed it back to November twenty third. So you got some time. They're not due until uh, after reading week. Uh, so, uh, but do do get thinking about this stuff. So the sooner you can get it thinking about it, the better off to be.